The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. This week on Q&A, author and New York University professor Robin Nagel discusses her newly released book titled Picking Up, On the Streets and Behind the Trucks with the Sanitation Workers of New York City. Robin Nagel, why did you want to drive a garbage truck? I was deeply curious about the work of sanitation in New York, really the work generally all over the world, but I live here, so my questions were focused here. And after some time hanging out with sanitation workers and doing interviews, kind of classic anthropological research, I realized I couldn't understand the job to the depth I wanted until I was qualified to, in fact, do the job. So I was hired, went through all the steps, and the first time I drove that truck by myself, I have to say it was terrifying and exhilarating. I was one of the most powerful vehicles on the road, not the biggest truck, but I was the one nobody wanted to be stuck behind or get next to, and uh, I, I liked it a lot. Where did this come from, your interest? There's a once upon a time story that I tell in the book. I was uh, about 10 or 11, and my dad took me camping in the Adirondack Mountains. And it was around the time when Earth Day was first becoming a big national event, and questions of environmental uh, awareness and integrity were really part of the national conversation for the first time. So dad takes me into the forest, and we're hiking for a long time in a pristine wilderness, and we arrive at our campsite, and behind our lean-to is a dump where campers have been too lazy to take out what they brought in. And my childhood idealism and sense of how the justice in the world worked and how adults were responsible, I mean, my whole sense of the order of the world just came crashing down, that this atrocity could be left behind a lean-to in this utopian forest, one of the last great wilderness areas in the eastern part of the United States, even then. And the question of the moment was, who on earth did they think was going to clean up after them? Who was going to trek all the way in and carry all of this stuff out? And the, the possibility of just letting go of stuff and assuming someone would then pick it up, that question was the seed. And it stayed with me from that moment. And it sort of, um, I guess I could say it composted a little bit. It uh, <laughs> became, uh, it grew into the larger questions that then became the basis of the book. Where does trash, garbage in Manhattan go? How far away from this city is it either trucked or barged? Trash from Manhattan does not go that far away. It goes across the Hudson River to a waste to energy facility in Essex, New Jersey, which is near Newark, and it becomes energy that is then sold to the communities adjacent to the facility. If you, if you want to know about trash from other parts of New York, other boroughs, it does go far afield. Some goes by train, some goes by truck, but it goes to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, uh, one of the Carolinas. It goes very far away. Why? We have nowhere to put it inside our own border, inside the border of the city. After Fresh Kills Landfill was closed in 2001, it had to go somewhere, it always has to go somewhere, but the somewhere had to be outside of New York. Why do those other states allow the garbage to come to them? They make a lot of money. We have to pay a hefty, a hefty cost, both in terms of transportation, but then in terms of what's called the host community. They charge a fee. And in, in fact, in some communities, the money has uh, made a real difference in their the economic base of the town. I know of stories of towns in Pennsylvania where um, because of the landfill that they agreed to open and because of the trash that then they were paid to receive, they were able to buy new fire trucks and hire more teachers and um, paint ta the town hall. And it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a devil's bargain because you are taking the stuff that is not the commodity of choice if you're looking for a solid economic engine for your town, but it does have some, some plus sides. 
So I got up this morning early. I went out on the streets. I took pictures of garbage bags. Okay. And I want to show you what I found and just have you tell us, for instance, there's one. Mm -hmm. What are we looking at? Sausage bags. Those are body bags, uh, another name for them, nickname for them. Those are 120 gallon uh, garbage bags, probably from outside of a, uh, a complex that has uh, a lot. It, it, that's like a big apartment complex or right there. Because of what's behind that, I'm going to say that that's commercial waste. In other words, the businesses put that out. I don't know if that's residential. Um, well, it's, it's near uh, you know, 76th Street and Broadway, and that is uh, an Avis rent a car right behind them. Yes. If, if oh, well, that's residential. Now, you there's something been. there that I, having read your book, and I heard you talk about Mongo, and I wonder whether or not those mattresses would be Mongo, and explain what that is. Mattresses would probably not be Mongo because of the bed bug scare right now in the city, and that's why they're wrapped in plastic. That's law. You can't just put a mattress out anymore without wrapping it in plastic. Mongo is a an object put out for the trash, put out for collection, that someone decides should be rescued. Um, you could think of it as like object adoption, maybe. When you were in the gar on the garbage truck, did you pick up things? And I'll show you some baskets uh, also that are on the street, litter baskets and all that. Is that the responsibility of uh, the sanitation workers that you were working with? Yes. There's one right there. Yes. Uh, well, that's parks. This is an interesting dilemma. Not dilemma. Just as different city functions are divided bureaucratically, garbage is divided bureaucratically. I would not have picked up that basket because that's, see this, the park symbol on it? Mm -hmm. There are people in the parks department in charge of garbage inside the parks. So they would have collected that. That one, I would have picked up. That's a city public basket on the street. The parks baskets are public also. It's just a different uh, set of workers picks them up. Though they were right close to each other. Yeah, I, I would have to see the exact corner to know the jurisdiction or why one, like the parks one is right next to the regular litter basket. Recycling basket, this is a new initiative in to try to help people uh, follow recycling protocols while they're on the street. So instead of dropping your empty water bottle into the garbage, you can now drop it into the bottles and cans only bin. I think we have one more, and it, I think it was newspapers. I'm not sure we got it. but. Um, why should somebody watching this in California or Indiana or Texas care about a book like this called Picking Up? The story is very New York focused, but only in the particulars. The, the actual challenge of waste management is a national concern and simultaneously a deeply local concern. Any city, any town, any municipality, you have to answer the question, who's picking up the trash and where does it go? So. And the particulars here are not so different from cities in other parts of the country and in other parts of the world. Trucks, human labor, union issues, organizing routes. Chicago just went through a radical transformation of how they organized the collection routes for the city. It used to be based on their ward organization, and now it's done. It's called the garbage grid, and they had to roll it out very carefully, and they had to do it with a lot of forethought and consultation with the workers and the communities, and it sounds like it's successful, but um, those problems are, they are hardly unique to New York. Where did you grow up? Saranac Lake, New York. How did you find your way to New York City? Well, it's the big draw. It's either Montreal, which is the nearest big city, or you sort of funnel into the Big Apple. That's where the youth of America goes, right, to the nearest big city. I came here to be an actor um, originally and realized- what year? What year? 1981, I moved here. Why did you want to be an actor? Uh, I had done community theater in my hometown and really liked it, and didn't understand that doing theater in New York is a completely different game. And I realized after time that my talent was probably better used backstage. I think I would have been a good technical director. Um, and if I really, really burned to act, I should have gone back home where the community theater program was thriving, and I would have had a lot of time on stage. In the city, you know, I was a young woman, one of hundreds and hundreds at any cattle casting call, and um, I don't think I had any talent that particularly elevated me to the front of any line in that field. But you have a lot of education. Go through the many degrees you have. Oh, uh, well, um, I either flunked out or walked away from college a couple times, two or three times actually, before I settled in and finished my BA 
at NYU and then was given a scholarship to Columbia University for my graduate work in anthropology. Um, so that's, I mean, I can say the degrees if you want, but that's yeah, it. Yeah, what kind of degrees? BA, MA, MPhil, PhD. In what? Anthropology, all, all of, it. of it. All of it. So you got a PhD from Columbia in anthropology. What is anthropology? Anthropo well, anthropology, I'm so glad you asked that question because one of my secret missions in life is to help everybody understand how amazing anthropology is as an umbrella in which to ask or, or a, a, a sort of a, a frame inside of which you can ask all kinds of questions about who are we as human beings. It focuses itself on cultural questions the way I studied it, cultural anthropology, but it also includes archaeology, certain elements of linguistics, physical anthropology, which looks at things like how did we evolve, which includes molecular anthropology, where it looks at things like how mitochondrial DNA changed over centuries, and we can trace that back to a potential common ancestor, the famous mitochondrial Eve from Central Africa. Um, and then there's um, uh, what biological, that's part of molecular. I'm forgetting one of the four fields. My professors will be very upset with me. But it's it's a, inside of anthropology, if you have a question about how does a religious structure or tradition work, or how is kinship understood in ways that are the same or different all over the world, or how is uh, an economic system reinforcing some forms of power and discounting other forms of power, and how is that like a different era in time or a different people in a completely different part of the world, it's both a way of learning about and celebrating difference and a way of learning about and celebrating commonality. And to me, it's, it's the place where you can have the most fun really investigating questions about our, our species in all of its glory and all of its ridiculousness. Um, I, I, really, I really like being an anthropologist. What do you do full time? I direct a master's program at New York University. It's an interdisciplinary master's program. I teach urban studies and anthropology and a field I'm trying to kickstart called discard studies. And I work with the Department of Sanitation. The book was one project and uh, there are three others that we've got rolling. Uh, we're organizing the archives of the department. When I started my research, it was very hard to find records in one place that were well organized. There, there are a few, the Municipal Archives has a collection and there are a few other places, but I want my successors and anyone with questions like mine to have a place to go to find information and details and um, historic data and whatnot. So that's the archive project. Then there's the oral history project, and that is rolling forward. It'll, uh, its next jump will be in the fall. And then there's the museum, which I uh, am trying to find someone to help me with the paperwork for the not-for-profit incorporation so that the museum can come into existence. How many garbage men, and I know there are women involved, but sanitation workers, are there, in, now are we talking about Manhattan or all five boroughs of New York? All five boroughs. How many? There are approximately 7,000 uniformed sanitation personnel and another 2,000 civilians, so roughly 9,000 and change. Uh, of the uniformed civilian, uh, I'm sorry, of the uniformed force, there are 196 women across all ranks, so very few. How many women apply? I don't know. When the announcement goes out for the test, there'll be between 75 and 80,000 applicants. So of that number, uh, I haven't asked for the demographics of male-female. When I went through the process of being hired, I was always either the only female present or one of, say, two or three. Um, there, there aren't that many. When you went through the process of being hired, what year was it? The first time was 2004, and I stayed for a little while, and then I stopped out. Then I came back in in 2005. I didn't have to start the process over in 2005. I just had to brush up on the truck a little bit. Were you going to be accepted no matter what under your arrangement with the sanitation department? Oh, no. I had to take the job, go through the test just like anyone else. There was no secret back door for me. Um, and frankly, Brian, if you took the test, there would be no secret back door for you or for anybody else. It's one of the ways in which the civil service system, I think, still has a lot of integrity. You take the test, you pass it. You take the physical, you pass it. You clear a mountain of medical tests and, and verifications that you have the physical competence, including sometimes psychological tests. 
then you have the uh, you learn to drive the truck and you pass the road test. If you walk successfully walk past all of those markers and are certified, verified, proven to be of the competence that they require, then you can be hired. But no one is going to cheat, help you cheat on any piece of that along the way. Which union and do they all belong? The uh, Teamsters Local 831, the Uniform Sanitation Men's Association, and it is still sanitation men, one word. It's a little bit of a sore point among some of the women. And yes, you belong as a sanitation worker, you, yes, you belong. Once you're promoted to the rank of supervisor and then superintendent, you belong to a different union, the uh, Service Employees International Union Local 444. So if, by the way, how long can you be, I'll, I'll just use the word garbage man. In other words, you, you, somebody who, tell me, tell me when I'm wrong. Sanitation worker okay. or sand right. man. Sand man, you yeah, call sand him sand man. man. San, what about Sorry. sand woman? Yes, well, okay. sand worker. How? <laughs> I'd rather you say sand man as the gloss for the job than garbage man. Fine. I just want to know though, how long, what's the longest you can work as when you just go out every day, and I don't mean just, but you pick up garbage and throw it in a truck. So the, the base uh, sand worker, how long? And you, are you talking in terms of the shift or are you talking in no, terms no, of the career? Years. Oh, as long as you like. If you want your pension, you have to be there for, if you just started, you have to be there for 22 years. My real question was in the end, if you stay there and you, you don't go to a supervisor role or anything like that, how much money can you make after 22 years? Oh, um, if you are behind the truck and therefore in the winter you're on a plow, well, everybody's on a plow in the winter. If you have a good year with overtime, meaning you've worked a lot of overtime, you're going to make in the 90,000 range. And what kind of benefits do you get? You get, uh, it, they're excellent benefits. Uh, sanitation workers get better benefits through the department than I do through New York University. Um, medical coverage for yourself and your family. Um, I don't remember the exact details, but it's, it's, uh, it's a tremendous security for, if you want to start a family, if you want to make sure your kids, maybe they have special needs, maybe they all need glasses, maybe that you'll, there's coverage for all of that. When you were in the process of going through it, uh, the testing and all, what was the toughest part? I became very quickly impatient with the number of times I had to go through all these different medical procedures and the number of forms and the, I'm not great with paperwork, although I'm an administrator at NYU, I maybe shouldn't say that out loud, but it, it almost felt like they were intentionally trying to wear us down so we would just give up and walk away and thus reduce the number of people they would have to process. That's not true. That's not what they were doing at all. But for me personally, the frustrating part was keeping track of the forms and making sure I was at the right place on the right day at the right time to sit through a morning's worth of filling out more forms. And the actual written test was not difficult and the physical test was, uh, it was demanding, but it wasn't, um, Unreasonably. What do you have to do? You work against time on a separate sets of tasks. One involves baskets because in your beginning years on the department, you will spend a lot of time with the baskets. What's a basket? Uh, the litter basket that you showed pictures of. Um, you were required to drag and empty them into the equivalent of the back of a truck, and you were required to do that from different distances and around different kinds of obstacles. Some you could drag, but others you had to actually carry. And then the other component of the test was just bags, uh, like the pictures that you showed, moving them similarly around various obstacles and some you could drag and some you had to carry into this, the, the, this imaginary truck. What's the most uh, poundage you had to pick up yourself alone? Uh, well, you, alone. The, on the test, you mean? Or did, no, when you became a garbage, excuse me, sand worker. <laughs> It's a tough habit to break, I understand. Um, I'll try. The, well, I worked a, with a crew once. Our, uh, the truck that day was 14.85 tons. So that was my biggest, I don't, of that, of that t total, I picked up my share of it, but I don't know. I mean, at any one time, what's the most weight you have to pick up? Uh, whatever's out there. I mean, there's not. No, I understand, but I, like, you say those bags are 120 pounds. Right. Is that the, the most poundage you have to pick up? And you have to do that by yourself, the sausage bag? No, you get, your partner would help you with that, unless you want to really wreck your back. Uh, some people are fit enough. Some men who, who really, and I, maybe some of the women as well, but I know of men doing this more often, they really, they pump iron a lot. They're very, um, they have a lot of muscle. And so they will take some pride in hefting one of those bags by themselves. But in terms of the weight limit, 
if someone puts out a bag that's 600 pounds and it's legal household trash, we have to figure out how to get it into the back of the truck. It's not, um, there's not a weight limit uh, per se. When you started, how much was your initial salary and, and benefits? 31,000, I think. Thir how long does that last? You reach top pay in five years, and top pay is by then low 50s, I think. I don't remember. It changes. Every time there's a union contract negotiation, it changes a little bit. So how long did you work as a SAN person? In title. You're talking about in title, in other words, employed by months, the city of New York. How many years? Or, uh, yeah. Several months. Every day? Yeah. I was broom qualified. I Meaning, you know those big street sweepers that sometimes seem to kick up more dust than they actually clean? Uh, I was trained how to operate one of those. You don't drive those, you operate those. I'm, I'm very proud. That I also worked behind the truck and I plowed snow and um, I felt like I got a pretty good sense of the job overall, which was part of my goal. Late in your book, you talk about somebody by the name of Goldsmith, uh, who we actually interviewed a couple years ago in 2011, and Steve Goldsmith used to be the mayor of Indianapolis, became a deputy mayor of New York. Let's watch a clip from that, and then you can put it into context of what you know. Okay. I hit the sixth largest snow uh, in history in New York City, and some things went wrong. You know, actually, lots of things went wrong, and um, we learned from our mistakes, and we're going to move on and correct them. Why did it go wrong this time? Well, um, in, in, there's a couple lessons in here, some that are kind of localized about snow and others that are generalized, right? So if you have a very uh, deliberate way that you approach a job, let's say snow fighting, and it works every time, then you, then you seem to, you, you execute that the same way. Well, if the snow is extraordinary, the timing is extraordinary, the amount's extraordinary, the wetness is extraordinary, fill in the blank, uh, the same path doesn't al always work. And what we found this time was that we didn't have really uh, uh, active, up-to-date, second-by-second management data, reports about where the trucks had been were off a little bit, uh, that there were mistakes made by others. For example, a thousand buses got stuck. Uh, and you look back and you say, should you have declared an emergency? Well, the people here who met and decided not to declare an emergency made a reasonably good faith decision. It turned out not to, be, not to be right. So the point of the story is it's easier to do a Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking uh, here I think we learned that real-time management data uh, coupled with uh, a little bit more in terms of deliberate systems would, would have helped a lot. What would you add? Well, first let me say I think he's 100% correct in his assessment of that storm. Um, I would add that there has been a trend in managerial style within city government over the past I don't know, 15 or 20 years, to make centralized decisions on behalf of the entire city for that particular agency. For example, in sanitation, when the plows are first deployed, the plow is always tilted to the right. But there will come a moment when you should be tilting your plow to the left because of the conditions that have changed and how much you've already cleared. Uh, s deploying salt, using salt on the streets, that's a decision that is key in some moments of storm response. Those decisions and a host of others are made centrally, but the geography of the city is such that the way a storm is slamming Staten Island might be quite different from how it's being felt in the northern Bronx. And it would strengthen the department, and, I, and I, I'm going to bet this is the same for other key agencies that have a similar style. I think it would strengthen the department to trust the acumen and the experience of the field officers who maybe are not ready to stop salting or want to start salting sooner than the central department bureaucracy is ready to declare time. Um, in other words, when you have a system for promotion, and you are confident that the people you have promoted into managerial positions are skilled and competent, give them the power to call shots at the local level in ways that are immediately relevant to that district, rather than have all of that central, especially when you have information lag. It's, it, it, we will never face a storm like that again, not because we won't have a storm that big, I'm sure we will, but because there are now in place very sophisticated data gathering mechanisms like GPS and all the trucks for a start that will help 
the department understand and respond in a much more nimble way than was possible in that storm. But I think giving power to the field is another step that could make a significant positive difference. What was the day like? What time did you get up? What time did you have to be at your truck? When did you get your assignments? Go on from there. You have to get up in time to be at work by, the dayline starts at 6 a.m., meaning you're in uniform ready to go. So most people, if they're smart, will arrive 5.20, 5.30, enough time to have a cup of coffee and not have to rush. Six o'clock roll call, you get your assignment, meaning they will tell you, here's the route you're doing today, or here's, here are the baskets you're gonna collect, or here are the special conditions that we're putting you on that are that's different from a normal day. And then you climb into your truck, 6.10, 6.15, and you're on the street. And depending on your garage location, your route starts a few blocks away or many, many, many miles away, which is, a, for example, the Manhattan 8 district in, in New York is the east side from 59th Street to 96th Street, Central Park east to the East River. The garage for that district is at 215th Street, up at the top of the island. And when you're trying to get from there to the start of your route, it, six o'clock, it's not quite yet rush hour traffic, but it's, it's picking up, so to speak. You can, it can take you an hour to get to the start of your route at 59th Street. Then you have, you're against the clock because your route must be clean. Your route must be clean by the end of your shift. If the Manhattan 8 is an interesting example. It's the heaviest in all of New York because it has the most high density housing in, in the whole city. Um, so it's got, it's got the heaviest routes. When's the route over? The route's over, there, there are two measures. It's an eight hour day. So depending, again, depending on where your garage is, there's a cutoff time in, at which you're allowed to drive back to the garage to shower and change. Um, or when your route is clean, if you have enough time, you will drive the truck to New Jersey to dump it and then bring it back. That by itself though can take hours. So what is more common is that uh, you fill the truck and it takes the shift and then the next shift, it's called running relays. You get in the truck and you drive it to the dump and then you bring it back empty and you take another one and drive it to the dump and bring it. And that's, the, that's that whole shift. Junior people get that job. I took those pictures earlier, somewhere around 5.45 in the, in the morning, <clears throat> this morning, uh, and by, I think I went back to my room and by 8.30 everything was gone. All those were empty. Is that normal? Is that the way that particular part of the city works? And, uh, or can you have those garbage bags stacked up for the rest of the day until, say, 4 o'clock in the afternoon? You wouldn't want to, the, if they're stacked up till 4 o'clock, there's something, I'm going to say there's something going wrong in the garage because they want the workers out on the street and they want that garbage up fast. Um, that means the route was not cleaned, and that's a problem. That, it, it, one of the fascinating things for me is how that problem, if your garbage, if that garbage was still in front of that building at four o'clock in the afternoon, that ripples across the whole borough, that ripples across work assignments and moving people who had been scheduled for one place to move them over somewhere else so you can get yet a third person to be picking up the slack for whoever didn't pick up that load. Um, it's, a, it's both mundane, they're out on the street every day, and it's also, there's a military precision to it that is startling. There's a problem if that garbage is still on the street at four o'clock. So was there, uh, during the daytime, a, a, a time when you said, ugh, I'm beat? Yeah, yes. Many, when? Well, um, uh, pretty early on in the beginning. Um, uh, either it would be that I was physically, I could feel in my muscles that I was doing work and, and lifting weights in ways that I was not, I was fit, but I had, this, it was hard. Um, so there would be some, somewhere before break usually for me, which is you get a 15 minute break at eight o'clock. Um, I would be really ready for the break. The other, for me, the other fatigue was when you've just co finished cleaning a street and there's no garbage anywhere in sight and you turn the corner and you go down the next street and there's all the garbage again because it's the next part of your route. So it's like, it, I felt like Sisyphus, except instead of the rock and the hill, it was the bag and another bag and another bag and it was never gonna end and it was never, and that's the job. 
What's the strangest thing people would say to you during that time when you were doing it, or even following when they re <clears throat> after they read your book? The strangest thing? In other words, people say, are you crazy? I mean, why sure. would you want to do this? Yes. Uh, when I was working with sanitation people, but not yet on the job formally, so I was walking out the routes with them, and I was wearing the uniform, and anyone walking by would think I was a fellow sanitation worker, but there were three of us. That which is weird. We have a two-man system, two-person system. It used to be three. Yes, it was three until 1980, until the early 1980s. So one woman stopped me and said, oh, I know, you're an undercover journalist, aren't you? Like, and I didn't, I, I said, no, that's, that's not it. But I wasn't going to go into the whole story because she was on her way to work and didn't really care. Um, if I was loading out the truck without wearing a uniform, that raised eyebrows. But once I was in uniform, I began to be invisible, like they mostly are. And then once I was on the job, I was just another sanitation worker on the job. Do you talk throughout your book more than once about this invisible thing? Yeah. Explain that. When you put on a, a uniform for a job that is a, a maintenance job, and this is true if you're a building janitor or if you are a sanitation worker, you are subsumed by the role to the point where it's almost like you're just a part of the background, I'm going to say almost like a machine, so that you are a human being wearing that uniform. The general world gets to overlook you and it really just sort of not see you. I've called it, uh, uh, it's like a Romulan cloaking device, if those people who are fellow Star Trek geeks will recognize that reference, or Harry Potter's cloak of invisibility, uh, which is both very frustrating and also an interesting privilege. Because when I'm wearing the sanitation worker uniform, I can observe people in ways that they don't realize I'm observing them. Because they don't, I, I'm not part of their awareness at all. And so there's an but interesting- even you're not? I mean- Well, I have my hat on and my hair up. No, I'm just, I'm the uniform. Once in a while, someone would look at me and be a little bit startled because I'm too old, I'm a girl, I'm, I was wearing glasses, I don't look the part. Uh, although, that points to the stereotype. Um, there are plenty of people on this job that if you saw them in their street clothes, in a million years you would not say, oh, you're a sanitation worker, I can tell. It, women and men. The stereotype is kind of a, we're all supposed to talk like this and have a three-day beard and like have you know, a cigarette hanging out of our mouths and we're not very smart. That's the stereotype, and it's, it's, it's a cartoon. Can these guys, and I say mostly guys, smoke anymore? Outside, <coughs> outside, yeah. yeah. And sometimes I worked with guys who would smoke um, while they're loading out the truck, but you're not so technically, by law, allowed to smoke inside a city facility. Do you have kids, by the way? I have a son. What does he think? How old is he? He's 13. Uh, what does he think of mom as a sand worker? He's grown up with this. I've been working on this for 10 years. so. His memories of the city and of his own engagement with the city have always been entwined with my connection to sanitation. His, his primary outer gear, when he leaves the house and it's uh, a cold day, he's wearing a DSNY sanitation worker sweatshirt. And it's, in fact, DSNY. It's Department of Sanitation, New York. <coughs> so it's the Sandman sweatshirt that they wear on the route, that they, it's part of the uniform. And he's very proud. He's very proud to wear that. Um, Has he ever ridden with you in the truck? No. Uh, he's, he's climbed around the equipment when it's been stationary, and he's certainly been with me to the garages, but he has not been, he did not ride in the truck while I was still authorized to be piloting a truck. How many garages are there in New York? There are 59 sanitation districts. Their boundaries are the same as the community board boundaries. So there are 59 garages, but there are many more facilities than just garages. How many total number of trucks are there? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm going to say 2,600, but that's, I'm pulling that number out of my head, trying to remember the statistics I last saw on this, and it might be wrong. Well, I mean, it's got to be close with 7,000 sanitation workers. Two per truck, and, yeah. You know, and then having well, a rotation. And then, but, but see, there's trucks, then there are cut downs, there are spreaders, there are FELs, there are... Right. Cut downs. So a cut down is like a, that's what we took our road test on. Uh, it's a, um, sort of like a dump truck. Um, the spreader, that's the, or the flow and dump. Those are both the big trucks that spit salt out the back on a snowy day. The FEL is the front end loader, which is the big thing with the bucket that, that's a fascinating uh, machine because it, it's jointed in the middle. So learning how to operate that with skill 
I, I was not trained on that, and it's probably good for the buildings near me that I wasn't. But um, and the brooms, then they're the brooms. We're all going through this business of uh, one basket for recycled items, another basket for this and that. Where does that? What happens to all that? It goes to facilities that then turn it into its next life. Um, glass can be perpetually recycled. Plastic downcycles. Some metals downcycle. Some metals. What does that mean? Uh, meaning. The plastic that you make out of the used water bottle will not have the same strength or capacity as the original plastic. It's one of the challenges of plastics recycling generally. It downcycles. Eventually, you can't turn it into something else because the, the molecular chemical makeup of it just can't hold. It, it's just not useful. Um, uh, New York has recently rolled out some very exciting new recycling initiatives. All plastics are now recyclable. This is brand new. There's a, an electronics, an e-waste recycling initiative that's just been announced. There's a household food scrap and restaurant food scrap a composting uh, program that's being pilot tested now in a couple of places. Um, it, we're getting, we're jumping into the recycling side of it with both feet. What happens to the just the garbage garbage? Well, the garbage garbage is landfilled or uh, goes to waste to energy facilities. What does that mean? It is burned to make energy. It's the current version of an incinerator, but instead of just burn, a classic incinerator just burned it. And then it became smoke and it was just burned. And then the ash was landfilled. Now that's a fuel source. Um, it's a, a, called a biofuel. Um, and it's not without controversy, but it's an, uh, at least there's one more function of that material before it dies in a landfill. Going back to your day again, um, how do you get into overtime? And you're su suggesting in the book that when you went from three people in a truck to two, <clears throat> that meant more money for the two. That's why they went along with it in the union. But how much longer do you have to work to get that overtime? You will, you're eligible to, it's called make the truck. Um, you're eligible to make the truck as soon as you're hired. But depending on where you're assigned, you are more or less likely to to have that opportunity. It's decided by seniority. So if you and I are fellow sanitation workers, and I've been on the job for 15 years, and you've only been on the job for five years, I get dibs at the truck before you do. Make the truck means what? Means that's my assignment for the day. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you have how to speak sanitation, a DSNY glossary in the back. We could talk about so many of them. What's bad time? Bad time is when, let's say there's been some disciplinary action brought against me and I've been suspended for a month. When I am ready to retire, that month is bad time and I have to stay maybe an extra month past what I plan to make up for it. What's bail the truck? Bail the truck is when it's pretty full but you figure you could probably get more on by squeezing, there's a, if, if this is the body of the truck, okay? And this is the back. There's a wall. When you start in the morning, the wall is here. And as the truck fills, the wall moves toward the cab of the truck. At some point, when you want to squeeze a little more on, you take the hopper blade that scoops it into the body, and you take that back wall, and you squash it together to compact that trash even more. That's bailing the truck. You tell a story in here of a tragedy when a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when a woman lost her life because of uh, somebody didn't know she was up on top of the truck. What was that story? Eva Barrientos was working on the um, Easy Pack, which is the truck that serves um, uh, buildings where the trash is put out in big containers. So when it's driving and at rest, the arms are up here. And then when it's activated, the arms go down. They slide into slots on the sides of the containers. And then it's raised to the top of the truck. And that's where the opening is, and the garbage falls into the truck from the top. Eva, uh, often the garbage will then um, clog some of the mechanisms, and Eva had climbed to the top of the truck to free some of the garbage that had, was clogging the mechanism. Her partner didn't know she was up there. He raised the arm. She didn't hear it or see it coming, and it caught her in the head. And that was that. When was this? 2000, I want to say 2003. That might be wrong. Did you know her? I did not. How about other? mishaps, injuries, the kind of thing, what happens? Well, there are countless opportunities for things to go wrong. The, do you mean specific stories or do you yes, mean... Yes, examples that you gave. 
the uh, there was a tragedy in 1996 when a man named Michael Hanley, who had 23 years on the job, was almost at the end of his route in Brooklyn, and they were uh, at a stop with household trash bags like the pictures that you showed, and they were tossing the bags in the back of the truck like he had done for 23 years. They, they cycled the hopper, meaning that, that blade that pushes it into the body of the truck. The blade caught one of the bags, and inside the bag, unbeknownst to anyone, was a jug of hydrofluoric acid. And it caught that jug, and it broke it open, and the, a geyser that they later measured at 20-some-odd feet behind the truck caught Michael Hanley full on. And uh, it, it killed him. His partner was also badly injured trying to help him. The volunteer fire department folks across the street who rushed to his aid were also injured. They had to decontaminate the truck, the ambulance, the firehouse, the, um, the emergency room where they took him. Um, he left behind uh, a family and yeah, that was, that was the first big sanitation funeral. There you were, said there were 2,000 people there? Yeah, yeah. You know how when a cop or a firefighter dies in the line of duty, there's a sea of blue with the white gloves. Well, this was a sea of green with the white gloves. Um, partly because it was uh, such an unimaginably horrible way to die. Um, and I think also because w we just don't think that doing a job as seemingly straightforward as loading garbage into the back of a truck is going to cost a man his life, but it does. More from the glossary. Calling it out. Uh, how much trash is still left on the curb to be picked up? Carry. Well, if you and I are partners and uh, you're not carrying your weight, Brian, I have to carry you. Meaning, I have to do your work and my work. What's clean garbage? Clean garbage is when it's on the curb and it's rather neatly packaged. Not exactly with a bow around it, but it's, everything is tight and when I throw that in the back of the truck, it's probably not going to burst open before I get it there. Cut the load. Cut the load is when the truck is not yet full, but you're going to stop filling it up. Death march. Either a route that is very, very long or very, very heavy. Disco, disco rice. Maggots. Where does that come from? Well, <coughs> not to gross you out, but have you ever looked in the bottom of, say, a garbage can that is writhing with maggots? It's about the size of plump rice, and they're squirming, so it's like dancing rice. And it's really disgusting. What, what's the grossest thing you ever saw Maggot. or stepped into? I, maggots. I can't. Uh, maggots. I'm sorry. I can't do maggots. Other people, they have no problem with maggots. I can't do maggots. Anything else that uh, you, <laughs> you know, the, 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 when it's raining, what do you do? You get wet. <laughs> no. <clears throat> but is it, does it slow the process down? Does it make it more difficult? And, uh, of course, the snow is another thing altogether. Snow is its own thing. Um, when it rains, uh, it's going to be heavier because there's water. Those bags are going to get waterlogged. The cans get waterlogged. Um, so you can count on heavier weight, and you can also count on, um, if you mind the rain, you can count on a dreary day. But if you've got any time on the job, that just comes with the territory. So. Did you ever have an accident? I did not. Did you come close? Yes. If my partner hadn't been quite wide awake, I would have sideswiped. Uh, there was one night, it was, it was a rough night for some reason. I was having trouble, I was having a little trouble. For reasons I still can't completely discern, but he saved me from sideswiping um, traffic signs, uh, vehicles, the side of the highway. Yeah. It, the, yeah. And how often are there accidents? Well, there are fender benders. You know, they're moving vehicles around all the time, so there are fender benders. I don't know the statistics, but I'm sure it happens a lot. In terms of accidents where people are injured. Um, that also happens, but not with, it, I mean, it doesn't happen every month. It, it's, it's unusual enough that it makes, that makes the news. You had some statistics in your book. I don't know what page they're on, but I'll just, you, I'm sure you remember them. Uh, the, here it is. <clears throat> the makeup of the Sandman. One-fourth African-American, one-fifth Latinos, one-half white, and there's a mixture of Irish and Italian. What's the background on what kind of folks come to this kind of job? Historically, Irish, Italian, and African-American workers have been 
backbones of the department. Hispanic workers also, but a little more recently, and I'm talking like the second half of the 20th century. Um, the Irish and Italian, that goes back to all divisions in city demographics and in ethnic, uh, I, I don't want to say warfare, but um, uh, conflicts sometimes. Um, when you ask what, did you ask what kind of person takes the job? Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, what, yeah, yes, uh, African Americans, Latinos, but do you mean what draws them to the job? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> and you talk about, you know, not only are they invisible, but they have a certain feeling about what they do. And you talk about wives that don't want their husband to say I'm a garbage man. Yeah. They don't even say I'm a sanitary, sanitation They don't even worker. say they work for the Department of Sanitation. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, you've got, that's a dense set of issues that you've just touched on. People drawn to the job are people who need a good job, right? And who doesn't? Sanitation workers are required to have a high school diploma or its equivalent. There are, there's talk right now of, of increasing the educational requirement, which is, I think, a very interesting idea, but um, that's very much in its sort of um, larval stage at this point. But if you have a high school diploma and you want a solid job that will let you maybe get married and raise a family, your opportunities in this day and age are very slim. Sanitation, like m some other civil service jobs in New York, is a, it's a, considered a brass ring if you get the job because you do get, uh, after time, a decent salary. You do get good benefits. You have job security. After you're off probation, you have a union with real muscle that stands behind you, and you can uh, build a life. Whether you want to stay behind the truck or be promoted up through the ranks, you also can learn a host of really fascinating skills. Um, it's a it's a golden opportunity. So, I don't know that many sanitation people who yearned to be sandmen when they grew up. Like some kids, they want to be a cop or they want to be a firefighter. But I know plenty of them who, now that they are on the job, wouldn't trade it for anything. And will tell you it was winning the lottery to get the job and that they have built uh, a really wonderful life. And they have friendships, I should say, that I, I want to add this point because I think it's important. The camaraderie that I see on the job is like nothing I've seen in other fields. Partly because, especially on the uniform side, when you share the burden, literally you share the burden of picking up the trash side by side with each other, and you know that there's a stigma, and you know that people don't necessarily, either they, if they find out what you do for a living, they're going to think poorly of you no matter what, or you can brag about it and be proud of it knowing that most people will not really understand it and will perhaps think poorly of you. But so you share that, and over time, it's almost like you've been in the trenches together in this war on grime. Right? Back to the glossary. What is a gold chain garbage? Uh, gold chain garage. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was reading the. Yeah, what's a gold chain garage? <clears throat> gold chain garage, that's slang for a garage that's predominantly Italian American. Most of the workers there are of Italian heritage. In that garage? Yeah. By the way, how do the races get along? Uh, in some cases quite well, and in other cases there's tension. Where's the tension? The tension is sometimes between the sense that groups of different ethnicity have more access to resources and power, and then groups of other ethnicity who feel that that's unjust. Um, uh, it, it can vary from district to district, garage to garage. In fact, I thought of organizing the book into 59 chapters and do a chapter on every garage in the city, but that felt a little cumbersome. Have you been in every garage? No, I have not. What, what did you have to do to let the sanitation department uh, or, or the sanitation department let you in? In other words, what were the restrictions on you? You mean as an anthropologist, not as somebody? I mean, you had to knock on somebody's door originally. And how did that, where did that happen? Uh, I wrote a letter and I followed it up, a, a letter on paper, a real letter, an old fashioned kind. And I followed it up with phone calls. And it took two years to get a meeting with anybody. And by then, the Giuliani administration was no longer uh, in charge, and it was the Bloomberg administration, and he brought back John Doherty, who had been commissioner for several years, had retired, and then Bloomberg invited him back to his old job. The only commissioner to serve twice, and the only commissioner to come up off the ranks, uh, off the truck, to serve twice. And the longest serving commissioner in the department's history. Um, and John Doherty brought back Vito Terso, his commissioner of public affairs, who had been 
with sanitation from 1978 until I think 90 or 92. I think of them as kind of a team, you know. Um, and Vito knew people I had come to know by then. So those people were my hooks to draw from the glossary. The hooks, the, if you have a hook, that's someone who can speak on your behalf and maybe help you solve a problem. So my hooks, Meryl Eucalese, the artist in residence, is one of them, and Ben Miller was the other, a former policy analyst with sanitation. They talked to Vito Terso on my behalf, and he agreed to sit down with me. And that was the wedge. That was the foot in the door. I, I think Vito recognized that I was not crazy. And certainly by then I had proven my stubbornness, because it had now been two years. And uh, he had helped Meryl Eucalese, the artist in residence, with some of her projects in the past. And from a bureaucratic perspective, they were you would never approve them. But Vito has a much deeper sense of the possible implications and how you let creative thinkers really have some room to, to do their work. So he was, he was more open-minded than his predecessors. Saw a documentary within the last year of New Yorkers who make a living off of going around the city and getting bottles. Mm -hmm. And there are plants that they take them to and all that. What's the interaction between those folks? You see them with baskets and they go into the trash cans and all that stuff and some of them make real money with mm -hmm. this. What's, uh, what, do, what do the sanitation workers think of them? Um, it, it varies. Sometimes they're just a nuisance because they're in the way of emptying that basket, perhaps. Sometimes there is a sense from the sanitation of like, wow, look at that poor fellow there, but for the grace of someone could perhaps go I. Um, and other times it's just they don't really pay them much attention. But you know, that I saw people in the documentary who had a college degree. Uh, is it, is it, how often do you find that in the sand workers, that people that have a college degree beside yourself, because you were obviously uh, hired by them? Uh, plenty of people have college degrees. The economy is not friendly right now for people who need jobs. And uh, you're not required to have a college degree, but I know people with master's degrees on the job um, who start as sanitation workers. And some of them are, that's where they stay, and others take the tests and are promoted up. What about the relationship between people that have lots of degrees like that and people who don't? And you say they have to have a high school degree. Is there a tension there at all? I haven't seen it. Um, it perhaps it exists. You learn very quickly that the measure of success is how well you do the job on the street. And if you have a PhD or a GED, it's irrelevant if you don't do the job well or if you can do the job well. And the respect you earn from your coworkers is how well you do the job. And things like, um, I don't, again, your, your degree level is irrelevant if you're the kind of worker who will stand up for your partner no matter what, or if you're the kind of worker who will rat out your partner. Um, your education is not a factor in those kinds of situations. Um, people with college degrees, Perhaps, and I don't know that this is true, but perhaps when it comes to the tests for promotion, since they've already been through college, maybe they have better study skills. And maybe therefore they uh, have a little bit of an edge in getting promoted. But I would have to look at the numbers on that. I'd have to sit down and do the analysis of degree versus promotional path. What city, town, urban area in the country is known to have the best sanitation system? Oh, well, New York, of course. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brian. Define best. Uh, just recognized as if you want to go see the most modern, the most uh, efficient system, you go to X place. I don't know. And, and I would have to press you a little further to ask you to define efficient. Um, we've just expanded the recycling program, as I said. Uh, Recycling, though, has infrastructural requirements that can work against efficiency, like do you need extra trucks on the street? And that creates an environmental stress instead of relieving one. San Francisco is famous for claiming that they have a, between a 75 and 80 percent recycling rate. I want to see the numbers that go into that statistic and compare them to any other city, New York, Chicago, and see how they count. Because you can say 80 percent, but then do they include commercial waste in ways that we don't? Do they include, th that's a, they're picked up by a private company, so it's not a municipal system, so they have different constraints. I, I don't, I don't want to say fewer constraints, but different constraints. 
um, than what a municipal system has. How many people apply for jobs and then how many people on a percentage basis are accepted in the sanitation department? Of the 75 to 80,000 applicants who sign up for the written test, after the physical test, that number will be narrowed down to roughly 4,000. It varies from one job cycle to the next. The test is offered more or less every four years. The department has learned over time how to anticipate exactly how many people it needs to get through the system and what percentage attrition to anticipate so that they will know by the end of the day if they have to fill 300 job slots then they have to have a certain number getting through the previous uh, barriers or previous qualifications. Farrar Strauss published this book. How did you get it done? How did I get the uh, Did you walk in the door and say, I got a book on garbage oh. you don't want to write about? Uh, you no. Know. Uh, my agent, Michelle Tesler, uh, floated the proposal to, oh, I don't know, 40 different houses, all of which, all of which said, wow, what an interesting book. We're not going to publish it. Uh, then I took the job, and I was on the job for a little while, and I rewrote the proposal to incorporate what I had learned as a sanitation worker. Uh, Ms. Tesler went to four or five houses who had already turned me down. And FSG this time said, a different, different editor, different crew, they said, all right, we'll take a shot at this one. To my lasting gratitude, I have to add. How popular has the glossary been? The glossary is a hit. I get a lot of um, attention for the glossary, and that seems to be the piece that gets like if there's a review of the book and they're on a sidebar, it's the glossary. Or if, yeah, the glossary, people like the you got to check some more before we close I this might down. I not remember them all, Brian. You'll remember this. Rocket. Oh, a rocket, yeah. A rocket is, um, well, the most common way to use it is that if you are given a disciplinary, some disciplinary action is taken against you, you just got a rocket. Salad wagon. Collection truck. Also fruit wagon, also white elephant. Who but names this, by the way? Who? It's, it's the way language sort of evolves naturally in any given culture or subculture. Short dump. Short dump is, short dumps are very important after Hurricane Sandy. A short dump is where you dump a truck as an interim location. That's not its final destination. Smoking shoes route. Really long one. Or a really hilly one. But the hilly one is the nanny goat route. There was some debate about that. Tiffany. A Tiffany is when you've done such a perfect job cleaning that street or putting the cans back on the curb that it's um, it's very, very, very well done, well cleaned. This is uh, a bit gross. Urban whitefish. A condom floating in the water, the river. Truck money. Truck money is the pay differential that sanitation workers get. That's what, when you make the truck, you earn truck money. One last one, tissue. A tissue is when, let's say you and I work together and you get injured. And you can still work, but you can't be lifting garbage for a few weeks while your injury heals. You'll be put on a desk job. That's called a tissue. What's next for Robin Nagel? Uh, the archive project. And I also want to work on another book which focuses on garbage-related themes, but more looking at how land is shaped by how we deal with trash and how that plays with questions of memory and our understanding of history and self. The removal of, of uh, garbage in New York City costs how much to the city every year? The last figure I saw, the budget, I think for this fiscal year, uh, 1.2 or 1.3 billion with a B dollars. Robin Nagel, author of Picking Up on the Streets and Behind the Trucks with the Sanitation Workers of New York City, we thank you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.